dear colleagues, dear audience, welcome to today's event, to the discussion on Marc Crepon's book, Le Consentement Meurtrier, a book that is being published in English right now at Fordham University Press, as far as I'm informed, and which is now also translated into Serbian by Zona Zaric and uh, Dusan Janic, and published by Plavi Krug in Belgrade. The English title is Murderous Consent, and the Serbian title is Smrtonos Načutanje. Marc Repon is a philosopher and former director at the Department of Philosophy at École Normale Supérieure. He is the author of 20 books and many newspaper articles and scientific papers, some of which are translated to English and Italian. The advisor of his PhD was Jacques Derrida. His investigations are focused on the question of violence, totalitarian regimes, and peaceful resistance, civic, uh, civil disobedience. He often refers to authors such as Freud, Nietzsche, and Camus, but also to the works of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Nelson Mandela. His papers combine the perspective of philosophy, psychoanalysis, literature, and theater. Consentement Meurtrier, Murderous Consent, was published in 2012 by Edition du Cerf, and it is considered to be one of his most influential and successful books. But in this short introduction, my task is to present the book, not by summarizing it in details, but by pointing at its most important issues and dilemmas. Murderous Consent focuses on the roots of violence without limiting them to the extreme cases of murder and wars. Through the deepest analysis possible, it de demonstrates that the source of violence is in the inner conflicts in all of us, in the conflicts between ethical, personal, or political urges to act. It is not so much action, but silence and non-action that, that become murderous, given that we are forced to a permanent and impossible process of decision between responsibility for the other that demands vulnerability and morality from all of us, and the possibility of responding to any call for help. Still, this kind of acceptance is not final, and this book offers certain alternative strategies, revolt, goodness, critique, and the effect of shame. Marc Repon offers a rarely applied methodology and a philosophical analysis that relies upon literary sources, Camus, Zweig, Grossman, Krauss, and so on, and makes possible a more intimate and precise understanding than references to usual philosophical concepts and ideas. So the book is very rich, both from a literary and a philosophical perspective. As I have already told you, we owe the Serbian translation to Tushan Janic and Zona Zaric, and we also owe uh, Zona the organization of this event, for which are very grateful. Professor Crepon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, <coughs> the Institute, for your invitation. Thank you again, uh, Zona Zarik, my friend uh, Zona, who has translated the book and organized um, all these all this events around this uh, 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 translation. And thank you again to the other Zona, the publisher of the book, book and it's uh, it's a great gift for me to have uh, this book translated in uh, serbo croatian language and so i will propose you some reflections around the book in five steps to make it clear and um, and now first step is entitled precisely translation there is nothing more political than to shift one would almost rather say to clear the way for, or rather to force a book from one language into another. The pages that were written in the context of a language 
and that are consequently historically and culturally specific find place in a different space, one that is impacted differently. The pages then seek readers that they could never have found nor have met without the help of translation and translators. One of the latter, as it happens, is my friend Zona and I would like to start by paying my respects to her. I have to say that Zona translated the book into Serbian, but she also translated my presentation into English. She's an amazing translator. She can translate French to English and to Serbian. So thank you again. But things are rarely as simple as that. It often happens that a kind of somewhere else inhabits and haunts one's thoughts in a more or less secretive or confessional kind of way. This is so even when these thoughts occur and are written in a specific language with all its uniqueness, most notably its particular historicity. Once we consider, once we consider the question of violence, of our indifference, our resignation, or in more active terms, our encouragement of and participation in violent death, food can no longer escape the noise, the noise of the world. This is all the more true when the said noise is sanguine. We cannot develop or form food by closing our eyes and ears. We are constantly confronted from all sides with images and emblematic talk of passivity, or rather of the activity of the murderous consent, which both are forms of. Never can we remain ignorant of the testimonies that tell of the painful trace left on murdered bodies and consciousnesses. All translations are important. All languages and cultures are able to offer their hospitality to a new book. But there are countries whose recent histories have been impacted more so than others by concerns of this kind. There are peoples who carry the trace of them like a tumor in their memories. One would have to be exceedingly deaf and blind to manage to ignore the unique resonance that the thoughts we have introduced here take on within a political space that was divided and unthinkably devastated by a terrible war just a quarter of a century ago. It is why it was so important for me to have this book translated here in serbo croatian language. First off, and this is fundamental. No peoples, no communities, regardless of the nature, has the right to allege that the dimension of belonging to the world, because it is precisely a matter of belonging to the world, and which we endeavor here to describe as a murderous consent, is foreign to the history and culture, to the literature and the ideologies they have adopted. Who could deny that such consent, murderous consent, who could deny that such consent is at work when all throughout Europe and the United States, in Turkey and Brazil and many other countries, leaders are brought to power through democracy by the will of their people. People who are fully aware and have full knowledge of the brutal measures these rulers advocate the threats they prefer, the segregation they seek, and the prejudice against this or that part of the population. Moreover, who knows what history has in store when a people lets itself be seduced by the fervor and the promises of vengeance of a ruler who can only keep the power by awakening negative affections. This is the first point that we can undoubtedly make here. Today, 
Today, the spectrum of murderous consent owns the world because there is no lesson that history gives us, no upbringing, not even an institution that can protect us from a tyranny that trivializes murder. Second step, murderous consent. Before we continue, we should clarify a potential misunderstanding. What do we mean by the term murderous consent? Nothing less than the indispensable dimension of our belonging to the world. If we want to avoid contenting ourselves with political rules and empty words of morality, then it is a matter of principle to know how to identify this belonging. So let us begin. We must allow straight off that a responsible, a responsible relation with another, if such a relation exists, must be funded on attention, care, and aid. These relations demand that everyone everywhere be seen as vulnerable and mortal. Any other position amounts to a clinical subscription to the arrangements made by a casuistic proponent of a clan, family, ethnicity, religion, party, who feels they have the authority to decree that in a given society or somewhere else, there exists a specific category of individuals whose suffering and death can be met with indifference. We can go one step further. We can maintain that this is a matter of the first principle of a radical ethics, an absolute, uncompromising, perhaps excessive, hyperbolic ethics in the Derridian sense. Better yet, in contrast to particular morals, moral scepticism, we can acknowledge that this ethics of responsibility cannot have any exception. It must apply to everyone and cannot be reserved for one part of humanity or would be just as quickly compromised and brought to ruin. To ruin. And we should not forget that this ruin, ruin which is also conscience's ruin, occurs every time morality gives way to a calculating politics, a politics concerns, concerned with defending its own interest even when at the expense of its, own, of its own principles and convictions. Moreover, does history not offer us numerous examples of this? People trying to validate or justify their individual morals, dogmas, religious catechisms, and confused confessions in the face of terrible violence, as if they had to pay their place in society with an agreed human blood. Blood. These validations and justifications are precisely what goes against the evidence of evil and cruelty. Precisely because this is the case, and we must, we might ask ourselves why it is so, precisely because this is the case, we must look again to the principles of a universal ethics, one that is free of the murderous compromising of morals and politics. Would we not be deceiving ourselves to try to avoid what seems to profoundly encode in human nature? Specifically, that men find ways of justifying acts of violence when it suits them or when it upholds the forces that they support, the very same acts of violence that they condemn when, when committed by others. Why not just as well admit that it is impossible to not take advantage of over suffering and death in a way that suits us and in so doing, a low ethical ruin altogether. But we cannot do this really for one reason only. 
if we were to accept this ruin as our fate, then violence would have no limits. Nothing would be able to contain and retain it. Ethics are needed precisely because if we relinquish the desire for ethics, we sanction the reign of force. This force would then have the final say and could organize and uphold a generalized reification of whoever it chooses, submitting them to its rule for as long as it lasts. This is why we need the principle of responsibility that we mentioned earlier. The principle of attention, care, and aid that calls for the vulnerability and mortality of everyone, everywhere. But this is not a simple task. As soon as, is, as soon as it is done, we must likewise acknowledge the most tragic part of our finitude. That in the ordinary course of life, we continuously make compromises with the demands of ethics. There are a thousand forms of vulnerability, a thousand confrontations with mortality that we, whether due to indifference, lassitude, impotence, or worse still, complacency, see, more or less deliberately decide to close our eyes to. We do this when our behavior, political choices, opinions, or ideologies implies a rise in the vulnerability of other people or an increase in risk to their mortality. In other words, in practice, our responsibility never lives up to the radicality that ethics demands. A demand that is necessary if we do not want ethics to become an individual moral or a pseudo moral or rather violence is a compliance. And there is no way that it can be. So our finitude takes the form of an aporia. An abyss separates the only principle of ethics that really holds, that is to say, that is neither hypocritical, nor partisan, nor partial, and already compromised, as contaminated as this principle is by politics. So an abbey separates the only principle of ethics that really holds, and the actual practice of our responsibility toward the vulnerability and the mortality of others. Why is the principle contaminated? Because when the violence of adherence, of course of engagement, of all individuals' calculations makes us compromise, this principle is always damaged, derailed, ruined. To live at the heart of this abyss, to live at the heart of this abyss is exactly what it means to what it means to belong to the world both from an ethical and political point of view but it also means more exactly to lay claim to a community with a linguistic cultural historical national proletarian all idolatry of belonging all cults of identity with their fantasies of purity, their historical guesses, their rewriting of the past, have a degree of this kind of compromise. They make up a risk factor, the risk of digging the hole of the habits a bit deeper, to the point of obscuring, or rather of suspending, the responsibility that is our primary concern. There is no appeal to belonging that is not exclusionary and vindictive 
And so they always dig this hole. A collective identity that closes itself off, obsessed with its own fencing off and withdrawal, is a vindictive identity. Those who adhere to this identity seek to gather together, even to arm themselves, by creating negative affections that fracture society, fear, resentment, anger, hatred. They feel the cement of unity is threatened or believe they have lost it and hope for its restoration. <coughs> so first step, the demands of justice the demands of justice. Murderous consent applies to everyone. It is part of our everyone belongs to the world. As such, it is universal. But there are historical events that have greatly exacerbated this, irre this irreparability, such as those that the Balkans knew 25 years ago. This is why our theory of murderous consent and its offspring does not try to distinguish the innocent from the guilty any more so than it does victims from executioners. It explains rather why it is necessary to find justice. But what justice do we mean? A consequence of the acknowledgement of the universal scope of murderous consent, this dimension of existence, is that its evolution is not a matter of building accusatory lists. It does not put together a, trib a, a you say tribunal or tribunal. It does not put together a tribunal, nor does it open a trial. The theory is rather concerned with setting the premises of what we call an epicosmopolitic, an epicosmopolitic. And we have now arrived at the earth of the problem. Indeed, the demands of justice, a word that is used to mean many things and which we are here trying to understand, can be defined when a shared concern for the state of the world brings ethics and politics together. Being in the world is surely to find oneself within an aporia whereby we are, by our very finitude, poverty of experience, and weaknesses of faculty, sense, imagination, understanding, always guilty of not being responsible enough. But being in the world is also to hear that internal voice that incites us to look for an answer by means of the invention of new paths. Paths that allow us to avoid the snares of resignation. It is to be driven by desire, a uh, topic one perhaps, but necessary nonetheless. It is to escape the cowardliness of the selfish accommodation of others and happiness and to escape that insidious dehumanization of life that considers violence a simple fate of existence and history. As Camus was well aware, our tendency to proliferate the consent to murder is perhaps the most worrying sign of our times, and it makes up the very essence of nihilism. Its major threat can be summed up in the simple form, is its major threat can be summed in the main simple form, what good would it do? What good would it do? What, sorry, what good would it to do stand up against radical evil? It's corporal control, a control that disciplines bodies while intoxicating them with cruelty. What good would it do to oppose the deep grip of images and discourse on people's consciences, a grip that misleads them while pretending to wake them up? We know this voice well. 
It is a voice of terror and oppression. It can only ever be put to the use of the dark blood first that lays dormant in all beings. And it is here that an appeal to justice becomes necessary. Another breath. Another obstinate contre-parole that whispers in our ear, telling us that all four the dimensions of murderous consent are inescapable. This does not mean that there is nothing to say or to be done on the individual or collective level. So fourth step, the multiplication of silence. Nothing to do and nothing to say. This is the product of one of the miracles of translation. These miracles are never insignificant and they make us believe now more than ever in the creative magic and creative force of the shift between languages. The translator of the Serbo-Croatian edition selected a translation to the original title Le Consentement Meurtrier, Murderous Consent. Murderous Consent that becomes mortal silence. This slight shift of meaning, really we would say evident warping of the original, was not lost on me and it is a change I fully condone. But which silence is meant here? That of the acknowledgement of crimes, of forgiveness, of justice, Let's go back to the global level. If there is a reason to acknowledge the universal scope of murderous consent, it is because there, are, there has never been a people in the world, there has never been a state that has no had to painfully withstand this silence. Whether we talk of the memory of a dictator with their lot of torture, disappearances and executions, notably in Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, or of the colonial and civil wars, the occupied lands and the compromising of these people of that through terror exercised by the occupiers. Whether we talk of totalitarian regimes or genocides, they are all haunted by the weight of silence, by its tricks, evasions, and denials. But this silence that is indeed deadly is not confined to the cruel sense of the word theater. And what the reinvented title, the Zona's reinvented title, and, and, and what the, re, and I agreed, of course, and what the reinvented title lays clear more so than the original is just how this silence reaches all circles of existence. As so many new stories and human dramas remind us daily, murderous consent occupies these walls of silence that victims throw themselves against. Victims of educational and conjugal violence and peoples whose place of study and work are poisoned by repeated assaults of mental and or sexual harassment. If we think of the terrible solitude of people who throw themselves against these walls without ever finding an ear willing to hear the complaints that they hardly dare to form, if we imagine the embarrassed silences, the cowardliness, the shifting eyes, the distracted ears of people who do not want to see or hear do not want to be required to speak, then we see there is a deadline in the silence of these witnesses who evade their testimony. Is consenting and keeping quiet one and the same? Decidedly not.
There are infinitely more active and directly participative forms of consent than a simple silence. There are different degrees of compromise. Actively talking part in collective murder, exercising terror, stealing, raping, killing, is not the same as doing nothing against it, not having the words to denounce it. One of, one of the objections that might be made against the generality of consent is this. We do not consent to something just because we say nothing out of weakness or fear. But two answers immediately arise. The first is that the boundary between passivity and activity is porous. When considering the effects of violence, both cases produce the same result, namely that the attentiveness, care and help that the vulnerability and mortality of others requires slips away. Both cases imply the same suspension of ethics. It is this very inciting radicality that the notion of murderous consent confronts us with. Let us focus on this eclipse. It prohibits our conscience from taking refuge in distinctions that might aid in exempting ourselves from responsibility. It incites us to maintain, in contrast to all accommodation of the suffering and death of others, that when we let crime happen, we go against responsible ethics as much as we do if we were to actually commit a crime. The second reply to this rebuttal regards the confusion or rather the concern intrinsic, it intrinsic to the notion of consent. Where, where does this consent start? When exactly can we say, confess, acknowledge to ourselves that we have consented to violence? That we have consented to violence? We have to keep in mind that no one as perfect lucidity. No one is aware of their own thoughts to the extent that they can be entirely clear on their motivations when they decide to keep quiet or let something go on. Because the ego, the ego is not transparent to itself. And because identity is always confused, we are not able to keep to a casuistry of our motivation enough to decide what we can blame on a collective terror. This is true for all forms of violence, whether domestic, social, political, military, or genocidal. This mortal silence that the Serbo-Croatian language and the miracle of translation have imposed on murderous consent should therefore be understood in several ways. This plurality becomes all the more meaningful when we realize, when we realize that it invites the temporality of consent. That is a time that precedes the murder, that goes alongside its execution and that succeeds in its wake. Indeed, mortal silence designates first and foremost an absence of words, the very slumber of critic. Violence does not take hold of a society out of nowhere. Again, in order for a part of the population to be targeted, hate speech must have already endeavored to poison the people's conscience for a long time. This happens over the span of years, sometimes decades, however long it takes to produce what we have called elsewhere the sedimentation of the unacceptable. Once something is broken beyond repair, as is the case in mass crime, genocidal violence and pogrom, we must always come back to, the first, to this first silence. This initial lack of criticism which is in itself an eclipse of responsibility. How is it possible that something we never thought 
we would be able to tolerate ends up becoming permitted, digested by society. How do we then explain that when there was still time, no contre-parole was strong enough, armed enough, and disseminated enough to oppose this diff, insidious deport of resentment, hatred, of desire for vengeance in people's hearts, whose feeling that clear the way, those feeling that clear the way at each step to the path of crime. <coughs> the time then comes when the worst occurs. Painfully, silence changes course. It is no longer a simple disarming of critique, but an accomplice to crime. It no longer matters whether it is active or passive. It is not really true. It is not really true. It has never been true that people are ignorant of the crimes that are committed in their name or that are at least claimed to be committed for their interest. Strange interest indeed, ones that turn the very people who these crimes are for into hostages of violence. Mortal silence accompanies the repeated massive obsessive presence of violence, death, and in the end the terrible habituation to it. It is hard to give a universal analysis of this presence as its trauma is so irreducible and singular. No one could ever know how to be a witness in someone's place to how war has upturned their very existence. Again, to speak of murderous consent is to address three dimensions. Is to address three dimensions. The universal because no one escapes it. The particular because there are concrete historical political situations that expose a given community to such suffering. And finally, the singular, because in the end, each individual is faced with its adversity as the irreducible crossroads of their unique history and particular identities or rather traps of belonging. Silence, silence has still a third sense to grasp and is by no means the least difficult. <clears throat> this is when the time has come to settle the scores of violence, but the healing process of past wounds, the worry of the marks is compromised by a falsification of history. What is withheld or rather confiscated in this ultimate silence is easy enough to guess. Confessions to the crimes perpetrated, the symbolic reparation of the harm done to victims, and finally the condemnation of criminals that took an active part in the ordering, orchestration, condemning, or execution of these crimes. This silence is an eclipse of responsibility that turns a blind eye and manifests as a denial of the depth that suffering and mourning have created. The eclipse suspends attention, care, and help that the over vulnerability and mortality call for. In it are the actor's refusals to admit to the part they played. When this happens, the violence done is multiplied. When this happens, the violence done is multiplied. Again, this phenomenon is not restricted to any particular culture or historical event. Rather, its universality is shrinking to the imagination. Wherever we turn, we find the same thing. The varying weight of this silence that owns traumatic sense throughout the world. Sense that follow, like a tumor in our memory, the half-buried, masked, hidden, minimalized memories of a past terror. A terror that a society either does not know how to 
does not want to or cannot make the topic of common knowledge, of common consciousness, or at least a topic of dissemination, of dissemination and debate. The stakes of the same from Latin America to Australia, in the United States, China, Russia, Japan, Cambodia, Vietnam, Rwanda, South Africa, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, without saying anything of France and Europe. We can encourage or refuse them. Go with or against the acts, but individually or collectively, those who commit acts of terror, their proponents and supporters always try to oppose this strategy of silent evasion, this work around tricks, these techniques of distortion to the evidence of fact, and in so doing impede, for their various reasons, the conjoined march of truth and justice. How could we assume, even for an instant, that this ultimate silence isn't murderous? How could we keep it going? It is undoubtedly murderous from the moment it disrupts what is vital to society. It is indubitably murderous from the moment it disrupts what is vital, vital for to society, the very relation between the living and the dead. Herein lies the meaning of his denial. He refuses to let those condemned by violence to rest in peace. This murderous consent is reproduced, is reproduced each time a crime is denied, each time criminals are protected, each time the facts are watered down, each time reasons are given a posteriori to justify the unjustifiable. Not only is the rendering of justice then put off, but the very possibility of an effective, durable, though we say sincere peace is compromised. When a society and such society exist all around the world, when a society is destroyed and forced into mourning by the events of an extreme violence that have left their mark on families in a neighborhood, city, and so on, there can be no peace so long as the call of the dead still sounds. This call is not nothing. If our lives, both individual and communal, can be defined as living with, then we live as much with the dead as we do with the living. In order for life with others to be possible, it is vital, vital to contain or rather to regulate the place taken by the dead. Indeed, it is the essence of the dead to invade this gives them an undeniable politics power. Is there a ruler who, lacking in popularity and success, out of ideas, propositions or solutions, has not given way to the temptation of making the murderers talk? It has always been so because, the who, because he who is able to make himself the ventriloquist of the dead is bestowed a formidable formidable power. Nothing gives rise to collective emotions more. Nothing provokes anger more, excites hatred and resentment more, more than the awakening of vengeance. A strange chiasmus. The more the society of the living keeps quiet, trying in vain to turn the page discreetly, the more the dead talk or are made to talk. So now, fifth and last step, ethical jests. Nothing to say, nothing to do. Let's come back to this. What the considerations of murderous concept endeavor to evolve is not only a matter, is not only a matter of the in universal dimension, but is constitutive of our belonging to the world, which is also the violation of a principle. It is just as much about ethical gestures that we can propose as certain tentative paths. 
That is what we propose while still fully away, but we cannot entirely get away from murderous consent. That this is impossible is a result, as we saw, of our finitude. Empathy and compassion are limited to the power of our finite, finite faculties. The radicality that ethics demands presupposes infinitely vast sensibility, imagination, and understanding. Things that are simply not within our range. In other words, we can only put ourselves in the shoes of a limited amount of people in order to give them the attention, care, and help they request. But these limitations that define our condition are also an opportunity. They remind us that the object of violence is not a general set, an abstract category that defines some group, community, religion, nationality, language, but rather a discontinuous adding on of individuality. <clears throat> Better yet, the first sidestep we can take into escape the fatalism of consent consists in expressing the irreducibly singular, singular character of the subject of our responsibility. Each individual's vulnerability and mortality. Individuals, not abstract concepts, require attention, care, and aid. Individuals whose vulnerability and mortality cannot be generalized or confused with a collective identity. This means that even for murderous consent remains an inescapable dimension of our being in the world, we manage to escape it every time we are confronted, rather exposed, to an instance of vulnerability, to an overse mortality at risk. We recognize this individual as irreplaceable and unique, and therefore we respond to their singularity. This is how we express what violence disregards, what it considers negligible, but what nonetheless resists violence all, uniqueness, the very essence of what violence seeks to destroy and thereby erase. What options do we have to answer? We can distinguish four, rebellion, goodness, critic, and shame. This list is of course not exhaustive, but the element in it have a point in common. Without being specifically manifested, they do not exist. They presuppose gestures or signs that contradict, that go against the spoken and gestural logic of murderous consent. But what is this logic, the logic of murderous consent? As war always uses this logic, it is now time to say a few words about it. So what is the logic of murderous consent? It is the needs of force impose, the needs of force impose consensus menacing, menacing, menacing rules. In other words, this logic normalizes what is said and done. Its common denominator is the acknowledgement of a certain legitimacy in violence or more so. It excludes the possibility that we can show reluctance when violence is used and that we can hear a different voice. In this way, this aggressive normativity prohibits us from protesting against, for instance, confirmed violence violations of human rights. This normativity demands at best that we close our eyes and plug our heels at words that we applaud or take part in active massacre. Regulate, exclude, ban. We see now that this consensus is the terror of consent. It is always ready to use any and all forms of coercion and blackmail. There is no way out for the people it is exercised on. Everyone whose opinions or sensibilities do not conform to this violence are accused straight of, of treason. This has always been the case. Those whose convictions stop 
them from taking part in the bloody celebrations of traitors. Traitors again, those who are adamant on not understanding why so much hatred has erupted all of a sudden. Traitors, finally, all who refuse to acknowledge that the targeted people are enemies to be demolished. But it is a matter of principle that a targeted people should be deprived of attention, care and help in one word of their humanity. We can deduce easily enough the nature and the meaning of these ethical gestures that can be raised against this logic. Their nature is also what makes them courageous. These gestures oppose the brutality and policies of the consensus imposed by violence. They oppose this way of seeing, of speaking, of doing, that invalidate others. Is this insignificant? Is this insignificant? What can rebellion, goodness, critique and shame do when confronted with the extreme violence on which our considerations pivot? We can already imagine the objection that could be made against the place that we have given these jests. We could say firstly that the moral scope of individual choices is not political enough and only concerns and commits the person who makes them. These choices only appease the guilt of a person who is not able to change the misery of the world, who is powerless against it. They do not change the misery itself. Does it then follow that the murderous concern and its poor offspring are really the ultimate version of the unhappy conscious? It is only a process that is typically individual and far from political action susceptible to overturn an objective situation synonymous with violence? We would perhaps answer that these objections are made due to lack of imagination. What is forgotten in making this objection is the subversive, the subversive power of this gesture, a power we cannot measure. It is all a matter of links and chains. Our political and ethical choices are articulated by considering what connects us, what holds us together, what we allow to bind us, and what we have the strength to separate ourselves from. This is precisely what rebellion, goodness, critique, and shame all have in common. They undo certain ties in order to tie others to connect and disconnect, in other words, to separate in order to unify differently. If mortal silence is a vector of an unfair complicity, we must acknowledge that only those who know how to break these chains have the strength to stop it. Rebellion, goodness, critique and shame, they all have the power to spark such a rupture. Indeed, what is rebellion? What is rebellion, if not the introduction of disorder to a system that is supposed to be anonymous? A system, the merciless mechanism of a murderous administration. It remains protected so long as no one takes the risk of contesting its criminal abuses. Everyone then is an accomplice. Everyone who conceives of and launches the infernal machine, everyone who keeps it working, everyone who lets themselves be carried by it, whether out of cowardliness, indifference, or complacency. To rebel while there is still time, to rebel while there is still time, either individually or collectively, is to add a grain of sound against this unanimity. And in so doing, add the promise of disruption. Above all, it is to assert the desire for things to be different. Think of all those forms of action in the four corners of the globe that spur from civil disobedience. The creative ways people have found to show their refusal. To disobey, this has always meant to separate oneself <laughs> 
from a legal system, from decrees of unjust regiment, regiment, regimentation, as well as from the instruments that they see, that see that they are respected. But this also means changing sides, to find oneself possibly on the side of the vanquished of the victims. That is those for whom the sole existential meaning and therefore political meaning of a morality corrupt system is the exponential increase to their vulnerability and the danger of a violent death. The scope of goodness is even more meaningful. Whoever experiences the violence of a juridical system, police officer, politician or military is exposed to a feeling of abandonment. That is not the least of the cruelties that are they then exercised. Suffice to say, proof of this is found in the simple reminder of those practices that physically, but more so psychologically and morally isolate a person. Practices that have always served to refine cruelty. Whoever is forced to go through this becomes a being excluded from society, a rejected a pariah. An experience shared, shared by everyone who sees themselves as victims throughout history, to be or to feel abandoned. This amounts to experiencing a painful absence of support, a lack of an elementary solidarity it amounts to suffering the melting pot of violence. But in their way, gestures of simple goodness feel this absence. These gestures are the basic forms of attention, care and help that vulnerability requires. A look, a smile, a word of comfort, an extended hand, the appeasement of anger, and first, or first. We have already addressed the matter of critique, but let us now specify what makes it helpful. When murderous consent is calculated, orchestrated by authorities, whether civil or military, there is always an apparatus put into place, discourse and images whose invasive presence on the walls of a city, on the radio and television, or on social media is meant to provoke not a feeling of abandonment, but rather of powerlessness. There can be no doubt as to the effect such an invasion seeks, to turn the people that is hammering targets into a stage of a new language, to provoke a depressive paralysis in their hearts and minds. It is precisely this widespread impression of powerlessness and the resulting belittling that critique can correct. It breaks the ties of propaganda and verbal consensus that habituate us to murder. It reinstates an analysis free of ideological strongholds. At the same time, it restores at least minimally trust in language without which we have no final defense against the worst. Let's finish with a few words on shame. Its ethical significance is considerable. We saw that within the graduation of silences, there is one that comes from denying that a crime has been committed. This is when, this is when, this is when those who took part in a crime actively or passively distance themselves from it. Even if they didn't know of they were caught in the jeers of a machine and couldn't have done otherwise. Never in the soul nor conscious do they feel guilt or responsibility. It is not yet necessary for us to be reminded of how such a reaction multiplies the affronts to the victims. A reaction we see all around the world, where scores are being settled, where the executioners of yesterday try to survive in a society just beginning to heal and reconstruct. Shame, however, describes the opposite movement. 
to experience and manifest shame is to accept the part one played in the violence done. This is why there is perhaps no feeling more directly joined to murderous consent, that is, there is no feeling that takes it into account more explicitly. Shame is the very impossibility of distancing ourselves from the violence that we did not see coming, that we did not know how to stop, or against which we will always never have protested enough. Thank you. Thank you very much for the inspiring lecture. Now I would like to open the discussion. Please feel free to make comments or to ask anything concerning the lecture. And in English or in French, both are English, French, Romanian, if you want. Okay, the first, the third possibility. German, yeah. German, but the others are more complicated. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your inspiring lecture. It's um, it's paradoxical that the talk about violence can be inspiring, but I wanted to ask you something. There is a very dangerous thesis that is, I think, circulating around academic circles lately that I've noticed, mostly coming from the periphery. And that is the idea that violence is transformative. Because we're used to thinking of violence as destructive and as constitutive, but not as being transformative. We is being? Transformative. So the thesis is that Violence is transformative because it brings new practices, new identities, and new order to the place. Mm -hmm. My question is, from your position, what would, be, what would be the deconstruction of that thought? How would you reply it to, the, uh, to the thesis that violence is transformative? It's transformative, transformative. Okay, that's a very good question. That's a very important thing. Okay, and uh, well, Okay, you know when uh, when when a philosopher writes a book, there is also in his writing something that I call blind concepts. It means concepts that are not enough explained, not enough developed. And writing murderous consent, and it's not just murderous consent, but all the books that I wrote before, all of them <coughs> has to do with violence. Even at the beginning, when I tried to deconstruct in my first books. Uh, all the uh, I ideology of belonging, of the kinds of belonging, okay? all the philosophical uses of the we. I knew that if I have, if I spend so many years to deconstruct all the philosophical or ideological use of the we, mm, it was because behind all the claim for a belonging, all the invocation of the we, I always. Uh, 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 recognize something that was potential murderous violence. And it's true that it has happened exactly this way. Okay. But violence remained a blind concept. And it is not so blind in, in murderous consent, but I had still to explain myself. And it's what I did in, 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 in the... In murderous consent was published in 2012. And then I published three other books one in 2014, 16, and, and, and last fall. And in 2016, and it was linked, of course, with another very specific situation in France, which was terrorist attacks. Okay, and, and, and I was writing this book just when it happened. Okay, I tried to explain myself with uh, uh, exactly all the questions the question you, you were asking. And uh, uh, because in the philo in philosophy we will and in, in, in social sciences we you will find many of course uh, many of course uh, 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 developments about violence, but very few definition of violence. And uh, uh, in social sciences, moreover, you uh, 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 focus of the causes of violence, okay. When you write history, sociology, the, the causes of violence. And my first answer today is that, okay, we have switched to an explanation 
of violence through its causes to an explanation of violence through its effects. Okay, that's the first step. And then if we think about effects, when you say, okay, violence can bring the best, it's always an abstraction. It's an abstraction because what it refuses to, what, what, what it denies is the only effect of violence, what we, what we have to take into account. And this effect is always singular. Okay, violence doesn't affect a category of people, an abstraction of people. It affects people one by one. It affects an addition of singularities. What violence does to bodies, to minds, is always something singular. And so, when you begin to uh, 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 to uh, work on this specificity of, 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 of violence, the fact that uh, uh, we are uh, playing with words when we don't want to recognize that what affect destroys, that's not a category of population. That's one, it can be an entire population, okay? But it destroys them one by one, okay? And, 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 and it's concrete, singular life which are destroyed. And so then, uh, 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 if you begin to think this way, you won't accept any kind of justification of violence, okay? Uh, 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 so, the book I was talking about, I just learned yesterday that it is going to be translated in English in the film. That it, uh, very often I uh, learn these kind of things without knowing that it is that the translation is going on. It's a book was entitled The Trial of Hatred, Les Preuves de la Haine in French, The Trial of Hatred. And it's, uh, it's, you know, there was this, all this, all this, uh, uh, all this polemics after the terrorist attacks because uh, uh, people were, okay, the French, the French Prime Minister at this time said, okay, when you try to uh, find causes to survive, to explain the terrorist attack through different causes, okay, uh, you justify it. What I would answer is, of course, when you do that, you not, it's not the same thing to explain the causes of violence and to justify it. But what I will uh, 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 add is, each time we, are, we have to face violence, we have to confront it to violence, there is an order of discussions. And the first thing that we have to do is to recognize and to analyze and to describe the effects of violence. And it's why in my book for now many years I so often use literature. Even is this one. The, the, this one, Murderous Consent, is the first one I did it very systematically. And I do that because when you are always focusing on questions of violence, okay, and when you do that philosophically, you are always tempted to go to abstract considerations of violence, forgetting what exactly violence does, how exactly violence affects minds and bodies. And, and using literature, reading novels, really, it's a, 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 a way for me to bring back at any step of the analysis the question of the singularity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if we think that now, if, if we think that now the, the, the main, uh, the main uh, challenge for politics is to uh, 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 develop all the ways of politics of singularities, to respect singularities, okay, to help singularities, to take care of all singularities, uh, uh, we will uh, absolutely refuse any kind of justification of violence. That's my, that's my, my political and ethical position. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Alexander? Thank you very much.
lecture for studying this topic in detail. Uh, I'm just wondering very briefly about some implications. Uh, do you allow for a possibility that silence itself is a, is a oppression to violence? We can think of, uh, I don't know, various examples, like when you don't want to give information about your comrades to, to the, I don't know, dictator or someone, or maybe, I don't know, Thomas More, his trial where he didn't want to say specifically that he agrees with the king, with the king's actions or something like that. So I know this is a bit, bit a, side, a side question, but I'm just wondering. Okay, so, uh, uh, well, okay, it's not a book on silence. Okay, silence is a very complicated thing. Silence is, mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. we, 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 uh, uh, okay, silence is an absolutely a necessary part of our life, even when we speak, okay, when we say we need silence between the words, when the silence is necessary, when we listen to music, okay, the silence is of course a part of it. Now if we talk about uh, 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 not this ontological or linguistic understanding of the, of the meaning of silence, but if we talk about the ethical meaning of, of the ethical meaning of silence, uh, silence has of course be a kind of opposition to violence in some very specific situation. Uh, there is, uh, I don't know if you know this, there is an amazing novel written uh, by a very famous uh, writer, French writer, whose name is uh, Vercors. And Vercors, you don't know, okay. Vercors one of this, was one of these voices of resistance during the, 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 uh, the Second World War. Okay. And this very famous novel is uh, entitled The Silence of the Sea. The Silence de la Mer, <coughs> The Silence of the Sea. And it uh, recalls a story, it's absolutely fascinating, it recalls the story of a man who is forced this is a man who is forced to, as it was very often the case, to host a German officer in his house. Okay. And of course he has no way to oppose it. And the only opposition he finds is to keep silence all the time. To keep silence and then, of course silence is a way of saying, well silence is a way, si <coughs> okay, silence is a weapon. Okay, we know that it's a weapon, it's a silence, okay, it's a weapon, this weapon can be terribly destructive. Okay, uh, we saw even in private manners, okay, even in private, uh, private uh, uh, issues. So my, my problem here was not to say that uh, 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 silence is always uh, com compromising. It was uh, uh, silence, uh, it, it, silence appears in the book just uh, 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 in the situation when you don't say a word, you don't do anything confronted to a specific form of, uh, of, of, of violence, okay? And, uh, uh, but if I would have to write a book on, on, on silence, I will probably uh, uh, First, explain how silence is part of our relation with the world because we need silence to express ourselves. Okay, so this will be the first step, and then I will probably move very quickly to the silence as a weapon. Silence as a, as a, as a weapon, but you know there is two kinds of understanding of this weapon. It just can be a weapon just to protect yourself. To protect against uh, the violence, against the, the when you don't want to see, when you don't want to hear, when you don't want to say a word, it's, it's something like a, a self-protection. But silence can also be a weapon when it is the best way to oppose tyranny, or where to oppose. We have many finds in many ways, uh, many examples of that in uh, even in. Uh, the Greek and Roman philosophers, even in st we have long developments about silence in the, 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 the Stoician, Stoician, Stoics, and all reflections, and, 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 and actually 
violence is also in certain specific situation a way, as the one I recall for this novel, to oppose tyranny. Okay. So does it answer your question? I'll jump in with a letter remark we were having yesterday in the French conference about the Bible. Why have they been shooting and why they not to shoot it? So the difference between the two words of serving, one could maybe easily mean uh, something that just isn't there, like to see in a good. Whereas shooting can also be seen as an active verb in the example that you gave choosing not to say something as a protection, it is a choice of a certain action in a way. And the murder of silence this book refers to our, uh, if I may say it, maybe a bit reductionist to sum it up that way, but they refer to every time we miss an occasion to act, uh, whether by apathy or just lack of engagement. Are there any more questions? If there are not, then I would like to make a short comment. At our institute, there is a research group entitled uh, Group for Social Engagement Studies. So we are trying to reconstruct the historical traces and conceptual heritage of to the very concept itself, engagement. And of course, everything you say about murderous consent in a certain way reminds me of Sartre's concept, engagement, because uh, he suggests that we cannot ever be passive, or he emphasizes that the boundaries between activity and passivity are very fragile, and he also I suggest that uh, the supposed neutrality of the spectator does not exist in fact. This is of course a very rich French tradition. For instance, Derrida also speaks of affirmation nécessaire and engagement also. So I have two questions in fact. On the one hand, uh, I would like to know what do you think of this tradition of engagement? And on the other hand, I have a theoretical question. There is obviously a danger regarding uh, this um, hyperbolization of engagement and activity and affirmation. Sartre himself had this essay entitled We Are All Assassins, Nous sommes tous des assassins, which seems to perhaps to overemphasize our engagedness. Uh, the role of our affirmation regarding the world. So there is obviously a danger that um, that if we overemphasize responsibility, in fact, in the end, we lose it somehow. Somehow that uh, that uh, we deny the burden of the particular context of responsibility. Mm. So that, uh, well, I can no. That's thank you. That's a very interesting. Uh, 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 question, you know, uh, okay, uh, you will see that at the end of the, of the, of the book, Mother was concerned, there is a chapter more historical recalling the conflict between uh, Sartre and uh, Camus and how they broke relations when Merleau-Ponty published uh, Humanisme et, et, et Terreur. Uh, humanism and terror. Okay, and but that was, that was the end of the friendship of Camus' friendship with with, with Merleau Ponty and and and, and with uh, and with because we we would say that uh, uh, Sartre he has been very important for him because in a certain way he exemplified what we could call an intellectual murderous consent. Okay. We could invite, and so that's the problem of the ten. So, so uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, of course, murderous uh, 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 consent and engagement are absolutely not the same. Certainly, but, but but it's true that engagement can bring murderous consent. Okay, and 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 it's why uh, 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 because. In, in Sartre's meaning, okay, 
in such meaning uh, uh, and understanding as for Merleau-Ponty, as Rosé, uh, politics had to avoid ethics. Politics had to be to be built of on uh, to, to be based on an understanding of the historical situation, but at first to avoid uh, all ethical considerations, and that's that's as some problem. Okay, which you, you know, of course, Merleau-Ponty say we have not to, we can't refuse the violence. We have just to choose between certain kinds of violence. We have to deal with violence and we, we choose our feeling, we choose we, the, the kind of violence we uh, um, justify. And so it's, a, for Merleau-Ponty, it's a way to avoid uh, 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 ethics. But it doesn't work because even when we have to choose, you won't choose just for political reasons. At, there is always a moment where to have to come back to some ethical uh, uh, consideration. And so my problem with SAF and with this theory of uh, engagement and with all these developments is that uh, at there is an, he never asked the question at the level where I would like it to be asked. It is at the level of the EFI politics mm -hmm. and then at the EFI politics. And uh, uh, there is a long story. If we, uh, if, uh, if we try to recall the story of, uh, of uh, philosophical engagement in politics in the, in the French philosophy of the 20th century, you can make a divided line between the one who have at any moment justify certain form of violence and the one who have always refused to justify any kind of violence. Okay. Well, I can recall his name. Okay, we had okay, okay, uh, Sartre, Merlon Coty, Badiou on one side. Okay. Foucault in a very difficult, particular way, but it's a very complicated as Foucault, uh, how he has supported the Iranian regime, but okay, that's another problem. And another side, we can see philosophers who are always being very careful to uh, 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 um, uh, to never cross a step that will bring this kind of justification and of course it's a case for uh, Camus but also Derrida in a certain okay. Derrida has always been very careful to avoid any kind of support of, of, of a justification of massive justification of violence and so, uh, so for me, uh, 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 so the real limits of the engagement are defined by this kind of justification. Because when you justify violence in the name of engagement, you exactly forget what violence does. You exactly forget to analyze violence through its uh, effects. Okay. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to join the discussion? If not, then thank you very much once thank again you. for the inspiring lecture and for all of you for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.